Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, um, and good afternoon and welcome to our session. Um, as you've heard throughout the day, there's a, a consistent theme of change um, and the impact that's having on our industry, and whether that's a change in the macroeconomic environment, a change in the transaction uh, landscape, or a change in tax policy, followed by a rapid change in tax policy. Um, we're entering into a period of, of greater volatility and, and uncertainty, and, and with that comes increased risk, uh, as well as an increase in, in opportunity. And, and for me, that also then increases or enhances the use case for ESG um, as a mechanism for both identifying and mitigating risk, but as well as identifying and realizing on the opportunities that it presents. Um, and to bring some substance to that discussion, uh, I'm delighted to be joined by, by a fantastic panel. Um, so I'm joined here today uh, by Ellen DeCray. Uh, Ellen is lead advisor for ESG and Impact in the operational excellence practice at Apex Partners. Um, Ellen has focused on ESG at Apex for over a decade and works actively with portfolio <laughs> companies on all aspects of ESG and risk opportunity. Andrew Noble is a member of Power Equities Investment Committee and sponsor partner to several Power portfolio companies. In addition, Andrew represents Power Equity on the steering committee of ESG VC, um, a pan-European initiative aimed at improving ESG credentials for VC companies. Zoe van der Walk. Zoe is a head of investor relations and sustainability at ETF Partners. Uh, and was recently nominated as ESG Professional of the Year, the Drawdown Awards. Um, no surprise as she serves on the Invest Europe Responsible Investment Roundtable and is also steering committee on sustainability. And joining us, I'm glad it's happened now, uh, live from New York, we're joined by Abriel Rosenthal. Uh, Abriel is the Chief Sustainability Officer and Managing Director at Talbot's Capital Partners. Um, she also is, amongst other things, co-chair of the Responsible Ownership Committee and the Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Committee at Towerbrook. Good afternoon to you all. Um, now, before we dive into the exam question, um, <laughs> I think we all agree that it was worthy of doing a level set. Um, so the, the terms ESG, impact, and impact on value are quite often used interchangeably, but I think we all agree that actually there's subtly and importantly a big distinction between each of those. And so maybe, Andrew, if I turn to you in the first instance, um, how do you define impact at par equity, and, and how, is, how do you see that as being different to ESG? Yeah, well, um, first of all, thank you very much for having me here today, Andrew, and, and, and the BBCA as well. Um, it is something, I mean, especially when I'm talking with folks in the industry, it's something that two, two terms that get conflated quite, quite regularly. Mm. And <clears throat> I don't think that's helpful at all. It is causing confusion in the marketplace, and I actually think it's the root cause of... Um, some, to some extent, greenwashing, mm -hmm. or, or at least unintentional greenwashing. Yep. So we talked earlier about you know, the role that the industry, the private equity and venture capital industry has to play in our, in our society, in our economy. And I think we all have a role to play in, in terms of communicating that better. And so I think it will be, um, uh, it will do both terms a lot of justice if we decouple them to an extent. So for me, um, impact is um, much more about what the panel was talking earlier. It's much more about that climate tech, that investment that's going into products, companies producing products and services, um, which are having some sort of real social or environmental benefit. Yep. Um, whereas for me, ESG is much more of a, what I would describe as an operational toolkit, and it can be really applied to any business out there. So earlier in the year, we saw Tesla uh, amusingly being kicked off the, the S&P 500 ESG index. Yep. Um, and equally, you can be a large petrochemical business, but score quite highly on ESG ratings. Mm -hmm. So there are differences there, and I think we have to be very clear about what we're trying to achieve with both of these uh, philosophies. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And there was, as whether you agree with his views or not, Stuart Kirk started to put forward a view around ESG input versus ESG output, and that lends itself a little bit to that, whereas you're kind of looking more at the kind of the output side and the impact that you can have. And, and Abriel, from um, Towerbrook's perspective, obviously Towerbrook as being um, a purpose-driven GP, um, also a registered B Corp, um, how, how do you view kind of the impact and how does that align with your ESG strategy? Yes, I think it's an excellent question, and it's important to note that each firm should come up with their own answer to this. There is not one across the board answer here for the industry, and each firm will articulate um, what impact means to them in a different way. So I'm happy to share how we think about it at Towerbrook. As you mentioned, Towerbrook is a purpose-driven investment firm. 
Uh, our goal across all our strategies is to build excellent companies that make a positive impact on society. And that's regardless of whether it's an impact strategy or a mainstream PE strategy. So we invest in a broad range of companies and these companies have a positive impact on society. And for all of our investments, we integrate responsible ownership considerations into every stage of the investment process. And of course, ESG monitoring and reporting is core to this across our strategies. Now, what our impact strategy does, of course, is go beyond. So our impact strategy, we seek to invest in businesses where impact is central to the business model. And that is the difference. We look for companies where the business model directly contributes to addressing at least one of the UN SDGs. These are purpose-driven companies with a clear path to improve social or environmental impact and where we can measure that. So that the idea here that we're measuring um, the impact at a deeper and more uh, consistent and nuanced level. And on that, we look for a different type of KPI. So we identify not only KPIs across our portfolio, but for our impact investment specific KPIs that are tied to the particular impact thesis of the investment. And then to conclude, it's important to note in both strategies, companies don't have to be perfect. You know, we're looking to take imperfect companies mm. and make them less imperfect over time. But certainly um, the key difference here for the impact strategy is it being central to the business model. Mm. I think it's quite interesting that your point there, because I think that there's, um, that there's often the, the point that we think that impact and value are, are, uh, don't go hand in hand necessarily. But obviously there is, as was discussed throughout the day, um, there is a connection between impact and value, and there's more empirical evidence over time that suggests that, that that's supportable, especially when you look over, over the longer term. Uh, but, but as you were saying there, there's, um, the, the point is that every company, and when you're measuring ESG or whether you're measuring the impact that those investments have, you have to focus on specific areas that are more material to those, to those companies and to those potential investment opportunities. And it introduces the concept, it's been talked about a lot about materiality. Um, and, and Ellen, maybe from, from APAC's perspective, in terms of thinking around how you would view or, or take materiality into consideration in your investment decision process. I think materiality is the key. It's, it's critical for thinking about ESG because otherwise you start putting everything together into one context and you don't have anything to differentiate and contextualize what you're looking at and understanding what risk exposure you actually have. Um, so I, I think that as we're moving towards a lot of data being collected around ESG, there is no one specific data set that can give you the answer to all ESG issues. And that's why for us in particular, we really look at what is material. If you take the APEX portfolio, which is focused more on investing in technology type businesses, digital businesses, e-commerce businesses. These are people that sit in office buildings that uh, have no influence over their utility bills for whom emissions Scope one, scope two, maybe scope three are, are relevant, but they're not necessarily a material value driver. However, if you look at cyber, cyber risk, data protection, those types of things, those have real reputational risk elements there that are critical to get a good grasp on from a value preservation perspective. So for us, that is that would be an area of materiality. If you have a different type of portfolio, you manufacture goods, you have lots of factories, then it becomes more about emissions, it becomes perhaps about health and safety, and then that data set is critical. So for me, it is, it is super important to put that materiality lens on each investment, and practically we do that by first looking at which sector are we investing in, what kind of areas, using SASB, the, the, mm -hmm. the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, what are the key material areas there, and then looking at a company through those lenses. Yeah, I think that you hit on the, the point there where, where it comes to, and obviously the, the, the exam question here is around the impact on value. Um, I think everybody's looking for a silver bullet, an answer yeah. as to how exactly and perfectly, and apologies to the audience now, we don't know the answer to that just yet. <laughs> well, there isn't one. Um, <laughs> there isn't one, but, yeah. but the, the point is you, you, you focus on the kind of the more material areas, and, and, and materiality covers obviously not just the, the impact on enterprise value, but also the cost of getting that information and how decision useful that information is going to yeah. be as well. And, and Zoe, from, from ETS perspective, how do you view materiality as well? Well, I suppose it helps to have quite a, a focus on exactly what you're trying to achieve, right? We're the Environmental Technologies Fund, so we are very, very much focused on the impact that our companies are making on the environment. And that very much helps cut down, you know, we can't solve every problem, right? We're not 
uh, you know, we're not trying to solve every single issue with every single SDG. We're looking at a subset of those that are very much focused on the environmental impact and where our companies can deliver sustainability through innovation. So again, a, a sort of laser focus on what we do best. And back to the materiality point, one of the problems is, is that people are trying to collect data. So we've got the tail wagging the dog, where they're asking about everything in the kitchen sink. You know, if, you, if you've got a bunch of people sitting around with laptops in, a, in an office, how much water they're using is not necessarily going to be very material to the impact that they're going to be having or the ESG risk. Whereas, as you say, you know, what they're doing and how they're using the data that they're generating might be more relevant. And we are deluged with data requests. And I think people are asking for data because they feel like they should be asking for data. Mm -hmm. What is going on with that data? Where does it go? Sometimes you say, well, wh why do you need to know the scope three yeah. of these, yeah. these guys that are sitting yeah. around in hoodies with a laptop? <laughs> they don't know either. No, they're like, but we have a box to fill. Yeah. We, we, you know, we need this data. And you know, not, not to point any fingers at the BBCA, but for example, there was a recent survey that the BBCA sent out, and there, was, there wasn't necessarily a sense of materiality. And mm -hmm. for people that you know, abhor a vacuum, you don't want to send back a survey with no <laughs> information yeah, on it no to say, oh, this isn't relevant, you know, mm -hmm. or this is not material. And yet we know because we are on the boards of all of our companies, we work with them, we know what is material. Yeah. But I hate filling out a survey and leaving <laughs> stuff like. <laughs> yeah, I think that you, you, it's, it's, a, it's an important point because I think that, you know, there are lots of different initiatives for data collection, lots yeah. of templates, lots of DDQs, lots of different standards, mm -hmm. et cetera. Um, and, and everyone were actually on a, a panel earlier this week around an, an, another set from Invest Europe, but which kind of has a broader kind of remit. But again, mm -hmm. it's focusing on the materiality. It creates one of the issues with ESG ratings as well, because a, a non-answer could quite dramatically shift yep. your Absolutely. rating, but yep. not necessarily in a meaningful way. And, and potentially, you could go ESG rating shopping. And if you didn't like the answer you got from one, and you answered in a different way, you might get a better rating with another. Um, and, and, and Abriel, when we were talking on that panel, there was, a, there was a discussion around moving kind of more away from just data collection, I don't wish to look at down here <laughs> at that screen there, um, to more to data analytics and how that then gets built in um, to the processes for identifying risks and opportunities that relates to ESG. So perhaps you can share with us a little bit more about how Towerbrook um, use, those, use that data to identify risks and opportunities. Sure. Well, as won't surprise anyone, and I know others are, are doing this as well, um, ESG measurement and the ESG diligence, it's an important part of our 200-day plan and drives the identification of value creation opportunities as we move into an investment. Um, where these frameworks are being helpful for us is an ongoing measurement and reporting. Um, we have to step back and say, why are we doing this? Why are we collecting all this data? And the goal is to take the metrics, both those identified through the diligence process and in the early stage, but also the metrics that we are now collecting through all these various frameworks. And we want to use them to drive value creation throughout ownership and hold ourselves accountable with measurement over time. Um, as you mentioned, there are so many ways and frameworks how to measure. Uh, we also started by drawing upon SASB with the materiality framework when we became the first mainstream private equity fund to become a certified B Corp in 2019. We incorporated standards from the B Impact Assessment because we believe that is also a very meaningful framework to help identify and drive value creation across our portfolio. We further enhanced our data collection with metrics from the SFDR, EU taxonomy, TCFD, and all of the regulatory initiatives. And again, we're we believe these also help. Um, they also help us drive and identify value creation opportunities. And then as um, Andrew mentioned, you know, the Invest Europe framework that's just been published, we're very excited about that to help guide us and draw materiality, uh, the guidance on materiality from that framework will be very helpful as well. But again, we have to go back to the why. Um, the objectives here is to lay the foundation for supportive action Tower Book can take that will help us promote sustainable value creation across our portfolio, and that's both mainstream PE and impact, and to do that as responsible owners. Hmm. And then, Andrew, then from, from a VC perspective, there's probably a slightly different process in terms of, given the, the, the early stage nature of a lot of investments and how you would go through that process of risk and opportunity identification yeah. as well. Yeah, no, absolutely. So a bit of, bit of context, Power Equity is an early stage VC based up in Edinburgh, and we invest in the sort of seed to series A, what that means is that the companies that we're backing at the early stage have anything between 10 and 50 employees. Um, 
So when we look at ESG and we, we think about it as part of our investment due diligence and then ongoing portfolio management, we really look at it through the lens of, of opportunity, mm -hmm. uh, more so than that, that risk mitigation point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we work actually uh, a lot over the last 18 months with many of our peers in the industry um, on a pan-European initiative, which is, which is ESG VC. It's been mentioned earlier. Um, it was launched by Berengia, so some of the Berengia team are here today, and it's led by them. They've done a fantastic job. It's now supported by more than 150 VCs, um, and even the BVCA are, are lending their help to it as well. So thank you, Susie and the team, for their support on that. Um, we, the, the framework itself, it allows us to have an assessment tool um, which is standardized, mm -hmm. and that's a key word, standardized. I think it's been mentioned a few times throughout sessions today. Um, it's also fit for purpose for our end of the market. So to the, the, the point on materiality, it means that these firms are able to complete what's relevant to them and they're not having to troll through lots of data for the sake of it. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it, it enables them to come up with a white space analysis so that they can identify the key things that they want to work on over the next 12 months. And then we provide them with the information and the resources that they need to get after those and work on them. Yep. So it, it works nicely as a tool. Um, we use it as part of our investment diligence process. So we set that ESG agenda from day one. We make it very clear to companies that we want to work on, with them on this over the life of the investment. And then we review it on an annual basis because we're aware that you know, things change, um, some things slip, but we want to make sure that we're working on the things that really matter to mm. the business at that time. Yeah, I think, I think Abriel, we were talking about this earlier this week actually around, um, and, and Andrew was saying the same thing around that kind of upfront proactive engagement, the transparency as to what this process is going to look and feel like post ownership, and that that's kind of addressing it upfront in the investment um, due diligence, et cetera, and therefore the kind of the, there's an expectation of there to be active engagement around ESG matters, and so you're kind of nodding in agreement there as well. Um, but I guess kind of moving on to, to the exam question around kind of the, the, the risks and the opportunities that, that we're all kind of seeing in, in the marketplace. Um, Zoe, from, from ETF's perspective, you know, wh what are the, the biggest risks, uh, and I guess focusing actually on where you're in the market, but maybe the bigger opportunities that are presenting themselves at the moment, some of the trends you're seeing? Well, I guess one thing that cuts across is that we're increasingly getting entrepreneurs who we would define as sort of impact native. You know, we're not trying to push these ideas on a resistant, you know, people who are, who are thinking, oh, what is this? Often they have bigger, you know, plans for their, their, for their businesses on the impact side and on the ESG side. And, you know, we're working with them to mm -hmm. make those things happen. We're not necessarily imposing stuff on companies that are seeing this as a sort of onerous, uh, you know, something that they don't really want to get involved with. And that's where that opportunity comes in. And, you know, we don't think of them necessarily as imperfect companies because they're so, you know, they're at their early stage. They're growing. They're trying to, you know, they're trying to figure out how they're hiring a diverse team. They're trying to figure out how they can put a really good government structure in place mm. because those things are no longer it's not that they're there and not imperfect and they're imperfect it's that they are not necessarily there at all so we're helping them build something and you know I, I I think of it as a tree right when you when you grow you know when you plant a young tree you put those like supports next to it to help that tree grow and eventually the tree stands on its own two feet and I don't think trees have feet but they they grow in a sort of sensible sustainable way mm -hmm. and we see that opportunity of engagement so we take board seats on all of our companies we talk to our companies sometimes on a weekly or maybe even a daily basis um, and we help them identify with the benefit of our experience you know nearly 20 years working in this area we can say we can see where there's a huge opportunity for you to improve and that's the way that we think about it is that engagement with the company drives all the opportunity there yeah, so a lot of that is along the themes of kind of, I guess, proactive engagement throughout that, kind of helping with that kind of growth story, looking at you know, new and existing investments and helping them kind of, and it was mentioned on mm -hmm. the panel before, taking bad ESG assets and then helping them on their way to become good assets and that yep. there is a perception of kind of value created through that process and it was mentioned several times before today that this improvement in governance in ESG over the long term does kind of create that value. Yep. Um, Ellen, from um, from Apex's perspective, in terms of the the risks that you guys are monitoring, or the kind of the industries, etc., where you see opportunity, what, what are you seeing? 
Well, I, your question made me think about sort of the journey of 10 years now that I've mm. been in this ESG space, right? Where when we started in 2011, it was sort of very unclear what does a good ESG program look like? What are the things that you need to be focusing on? And how that conversation has moved on from mm. that those early g days of sort of like, <laughs> what are we supposed to do to where we are today, where actually you're seeing a lot of thematic engagement mm. around, even though there is this materiality lens that we should look at, but it is around climate. Everyone needs to address climate. It is about DNI. Everyone needs to address diversity in their companies, on their boards. Cybersecurity. I think there isn't a company in the world today that shouldn't have a cybersecurity yep. uh, program in place. And so, that that sort of the, the, it's much more articulated now. What are sort of the hallmarks of risk? and also of opportunity. And then around that, if you look at sort of for specific situations, specific sectors with that materiality lens, there are other items that you can add on to this. So that I think is a great improvement. Mm -hmm. And obviously on the horizon, we're seeing biodiversity, we're seeing human rights. And so there's more sort of of those themes that are coming along, but those are more specific to specific sectors. But it's this data point, I think that Zoe mentioned, and it's you hear it coming back more and more from people that are sitting in our chairs, which is, this, 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 this ocean of data that we're now starting to provide, where people are trying to distill messages. We hope that our voices are being heard <laughs> mm. on the other side to say, let's be a bit more thoughtful, because we just don't have enough people to start analyzing this data, to come up with meaningful narratives around what's a firm doing on climate action, what's a portfolio doing on climate action, how is diversity relevant in this business and in mm. that sector. It needs to be more synthesized. So I think, I, I, I think we're on a great trajectory. The fact that data is now something that everyone is talking about and everyone is thinking about is fantastic. Mm. Now let's start being sensible about what we do with that data. I think that's, that's a risk for the industry, <laughs> yep. that we end up spending too much time thinking about useless data instead mm. of engaging, as Zoe yeah. says, with companies to provide that support for businesses to grow. Yeah, yeah it, it raises an interesting question because, um, as we kind of said and we said before, actually coming up with a, a silver bullet for how these things impact valuation directly, individually and collectively is yep. quite difficult. In fact, it's very difficult. So we understand that improved diverse inclusiveness will support kind of growth, engagement, et cetera, innovation. Um, but quantifying that becomes quite difficult. But actually, that doesn't seem to be stopping the industry from proceeding with it because there's there's a collective thought that an, an agreement that 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 is the case. Um, so it, it, I you know, think that, that you know, the, the, the perception of kind of, I think you're right, so then that, that, that means there's an opportunity because I think it's almost a self-fulfilling prophecy that people support that, yep. will see that improvement over time, will see that kind of impact on value. And we see ourselves, we've done an academic study on looking over the last 10 years of kind of ESG ratings, imperfect as a, as a source of data as they are, um, but, and there's been meta studies on it as well that supports broadly that an improvements in ESG ratings and the component parts of it over a long term do have an impact on a positive impact on value. Yeah. Caveat that slightly, our study does show that in certain geographies it doesn't and, and but that doesn't seem to be stopping the investment into into thinking about this. And, and I guess that's just the this kind of natural evolution of ESG. You kind of see it as being like this this identification, we need to know where we are, we need all this data to know where we are. But people are still wanting to improve it, even though there's not been proven out. But that's where the greenwashing point is so important, mm. yeah. Yeah. right? And also where the disaggregation of E, S, and G needs, I, I, you know, in terms of, I know you're probably going to say what, you know, further trends you're seeing or, you know, but one of them is that if you, if you agglomerate E, S, and G, it's a category error, right? You mm. know, there, there are companies that, as you say, can score highly on ESG and low on impact or vice versa. But at the same time, if you you know, aggregate E, S, and G, you can score very highly on one of the three and make it look like you're doing better on the other things yeah. than you perhaps actually are. And so in terms of trends, if we're going to be collecting all this data, why aggregate them together at all? Why mm -hmm. not put them together with all the other things that we're doing to build more resilient, more sustainable businesses that are creating great value and addressing with the impact they're having on the world all, mm -hmm. of, these pr all of these, you know, issues? Yeah, I think we, when we, we talked for the panel around, around the issues with the term ESG. <laughs> I mean, um, I don't want to sit up and, here and, and say and, ESG yeah, shouldn't yeah, exist. But yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, think was, I think it's the death of ESG. This is the yeah. first, uh, first day of it. But um, it, it does kind of raise the question as to, obviously, there's going to be a natural, we've seen a big evolution over the last 10 years of what ESG is, what it means, how it's measured, what it's, um, where its place is. Um, what do you, and I'm going to go around very quickly because I'm conscious of time, um, in a very short summary, like what do you want to see ESG become in the future? And if that's nothing or it's just <laughs> everything, then, then that's kind of interesting. But maybe we'll just kind yeah. of go along the panel, Andrew. Yeah. Um, so f for me, I think ESG is just about building better businesses. It is 
business 101. It should be part of every company's standard operating practice to build these components into what they're doing. So whether it's ESG or we call it something else, quite frankly, I don't care as long as companies are thinking in this way. Mm -hmm. um, that's the most important thing. And I think if I just have 30 seconds, because we're in a really privileged position investing into yeah. these early stage companies that want to reshape their industries. They want to be global leaders in their respective fields. And they are, there's a market pool there. They're thinking 5, 10, 15, 20 years ahead. And they are coming to us and saying, look, I am wanting to reduce my, my, my carbon emissions mm -hmm. or at least limit it as I grow. I'm wanting to look at my uh, supply chain and reduce risk. I'm wanting to improve or at least reduce any board entrenchment in my business. How do we go about it? So there's the market pool for that. And I think if we take a long-term outlook, I think it's extremely positive for ESG or whatever we want to call it in the future. Definitely. I would add to yeah. that and say an increased f focus, not just on the what, how the companies are doing it, but what they're doing as well. So the, the combining you know, the good housekeeping at home but also making sure that those companies are having a, a positive impact on the world through their products and services. They're, I think combining those two is absolutely the way to go in the future. Uh, well, I think pragmatically, right, we need to think about how many resources do we have within this industry because ultimately we're all trying to engage on ESG. Mm -hmm. But if most of the focus of the people sitting on these in these roles is going to be around how do we build data pipes and build the plumbing, then we lose the focus on engagement. So how I would wish for it to evolve is that that there is, again, that thoughtfulness around mm -hmm. how do we, how, how within the chain of, of the private equity sector, are, is the engagement model deployed from the capital providers to the asset managers to the portfolio companies and that there is a, a focus on the risk where it needs to be yep. and not just this endless pool of data provision which leads to data quality issues, data integrity issues, data assurance mm. issues, which just it, it's a benchmarking across funds, across private equity is not a sector. Yep. You can't benchmark yep. funds against each other because we're all different. Yep. So that is a fallacy in itself. So I think we need to try to move, <laughs> move yep. the conversation on yep. to risk and impact. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Um, Abriel, last words from, from New York before we close out the session? Sure. I, when you ask what um, we hope to see, I want to answer a little bit beyond just Tower Brook. I think the real opportunity here is for the industry as a whole, and it's around convergence. And that's why we are so supportive of initiatives that seek to work together uh, to align what we are all asking and to ask it in the same way. And we are founding members of the ESG Data Convergence Initiative and on the steering committee. And that is an example of um, an initiative that has brought the industry together. We currently have over 200 signatories that are committing to report on a small set of six uh, metrics, but to do it in the same way. And that is the opportunity here. If we all come together and we unify around a standard way of asking the same questions when we are asking those same questions, we will all benefit. And our ability to drive change in the industry together will be exponential. So that's really where um, we see the opportunity here around ESG. It's in coming together, asking this, the questions in the same way together and pulling together to really truly drive a meaningful and measurable change. Brilliant. I would argue okay. the benchmarking is a bit of an issue there, but that is a separate conversation. Yeah, exactly. We could yeah. talk about data and yeah. benchmarking for yeah. a long time, <laughs> uh, but we only have eight seconds left. Um, so with that, I mean, Abriel, I don't think any of us could have summarized that kind of better in terms of the, you know, the collective um, you know, convergence, the need to support each other in this kind of journey and to make the genuine kind of impact that we all want to see is the most important thing. Um, and with that, um, thanks very much, everybody. <laughs>